Hello guys, welcome back. I've changed my scenery. How's everyone doing? How are you doing, Jerome? We're well, Jonathan. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, it's good to be on um, Carnival Muscle Ramblings. Live Q&A, segment 33. That's insane. That's insane, That's it? a lot. It's a lot, isn't it? I think most people do these weekly. Maybe that. Maybe if that. It's good, though. Very good. <laughs> yes, well, so this will be to... the Monday segment. I suppose compared to you, uh, everybody else's weekly segment is spelled uh, W E A K. <laughs> Week. Yeah. Week. Week as hell. <laughs> <laughs> Those beta boys. Yeah. Oh, yeah, those ones. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to have a little talk today, aren't we, about um, measuring food intakes? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be a nice follow up to all the uh, calorie conversations that we've had recently. Yeah, heaps, heaps and heaps and heaps. <laughs> just because you know, I think people get frustrated. It's like, oh, you know, you're talking about calories again. Yeah, but I like to look at food labels. I'm like, stop eating foods with food labels on them. It's a bit easier, I think. Yeah, unfortunately, even a lot of steak here in the states. If you flip the package over, it'll give you the not so much the nutrition. Well, yeah, it'll give you the uh, nutrition label, and it ingredients will just say like 100 percent beef. <laughs> so. Mm. That's mad, no? Excellent, excellent stuff. But I do reference that sometimes. I, I do kind of keep a loose eye on the uh, protein to uh, fat ratio of certain cuts. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can never be exact. Um, yeah. Anyway, so we'll talk about, we're going to talk about measuring food intakes on the carnivore diet. And how would you do that? Do we look at calories on labels? Do we look at macros? Do you look at the food itself? Um, is there some sort of other measurement? What are we looking at here? So um, I'll probably start by saying on this channel we don't like to talk about calories because they're not an accurate measurement of energy contained within food. But not only are they not an accurate measurement when it comes into when it comes to terms with what we absorb and um, ingest in terms of the energetic value of the food itself but they aren't a good determinant of how our body composition will change. Mm -hmm. and I've always made that case about um, me not eating for like a week or two than not losing any weight. You know, I've, I've met loads of people like, oh, I eat a thousand calories per day and I've not, not lost weight. I've done an hour of cardio and an hour of weights five times a week and, you know, they're eating like a low-fat diet and just goes to show that it's not, um, it's not clear cut as in just reduce your calories and increase your energy output then that's going to do all the results for you. You know, it's not going to give you everything, I think. But yeah, I mean, w what is the definition of um, calories anyway? Like how are they defined? How are they measured? How does that come into it? Yeah, so a food calorie is a kilocalorie and a normal calorie is the amount of heat it takes to raise uh, one milliliter of water, one degree Celsius. So a food calorie would be the amount of energy that it would take to raise uh, one liter of water one degree Celsius. Um, so I know that conventionally calories are used as a way to loosely approximate food intake, but it's a bit arbitrary in a sense to measure a certain mass of food by the amount of energy that it gives off when it's combusted in a bomb calorimeter. Um, <clears throat> our bodies, while we will oxidize food uh, in our mitochondria, um, what we're really doing, and the more precise way to put it is we're converting one form of substrate into another. Um, virtually everything we eat that we absorb is integrated into our tissues or it's converted into ATP and it's oxidized and used for energy. Um, and mass is conserved in all of the chemical equations in the body. Every single chemical interaction, mass is conserved. So it's it's arbitrary to measure the heat energy that's given off as a result of those chemical equations when we really should be talking about mass. If mass is the thing that we're focusing on, either building muscle, gaining fat, or losing fat, then we should be measuring our food in terms of mass. And the further away we get from that, the less uh, <laughs> the less, less accurate we can be. Yeah, really. thank you. I, I couldn't get yeah. caught up on that one. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think there's a, there's an order of things, and of course now we've been indoctrinated over the last perhaps I don't know I couldn't even say how many years maybe like fifty years say to look at calories. Um, it's just one 
measurement they just came up with and thought, oh, that will do, you know. We can stick this on a label, it gives us people rough idea. Like, we know a, a banana might have 100 calories, but then a chocolate bar might have 500. Mm -hmm. It's very vague, but then, of course, if you have a bunch of bananas, there'll be 500 calories or more. So it doesn't give you an idea or interpretation of the um, the food quality as itself, um, the macronutrient composition. Yeah. So yeah. what I always find when I'm looking at different videos online, different diet plans, Instagram, you know, people share their stuff. It's like um, I'm eating 200 protein per day, I don't know, 200 fat or say 100 fat and um, maybe 100 grams of carbs. And I'm like, okay, it's 400 plus 800, okay, it's 1200 plus 900. That's 1100 calories per day, something like that. Yeah. I'm thinking, okay. They're going to tell me how many calories in it. Oh, yeah, and it's only 2,100 calories or whatever it happens to be. And they get so hyped up over that number. Like, they've got the, the great grammages below. Like, they're completely ignoring. They've went for all that effort to work out. You know, some labs somewhere have went for all that effort to work out how much nutrients, terms of grams, macronutrients, protein, fats, and carbs are in different foods. Then they've kind of dismissed that. and just said, oh, that doesn't really matter. Let's just look at the bigger number at the top. It's um, <laughs> quite an ignorant approach, in my opinion. It's it's daft, it's useless, it's um, not very thought out. I think it kind of makes me think how much are people questioning what they're hearing. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how often do we do guys like you and I uh, meet during where they're educated people, perhaps in the high-intensity training realm or perhaps the bodybuilding fitness culture itself? You mm -hmm. think, oh, you, you know, they're, they're, they're spot on people. They know exactly what they're talking about. Then they, it comes to diet, nutrition, oh, yeah, just reduce your calories. I'm thinking, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. We've got lost somewhere along the way. And it's not, um, it's not revolutionary. You know, like when I speak to people from the past, like in bodybuilding years, um, perhaps like, you know, Mr. Britons from like 30, 40 years ago, they weren't looking at calories, guys. They were looking at, I'm eating, I don't know, 200 grams of chicken per meal with 200 grams of rice or potatoes. Mm -hmm. That's probably the best accurate, accurate, most accurate measurement you can make for food because it is what it is the food itself is the food you can't um re you, can't, you can't really dissuade from the fact that a 200 gram chicken breast will give you the same in energy intake near enough as a 200 gram um, chicken breast yep. assuming the fat quantities are about the same amount then as soon as you start putting labels on it the food's processed it's cooked differently um you start adding oils to it you add different foods like you know it's, it's been ground up it's been processed and tinned that changes the calorie amount um, how do we know that? I mean, a baked potato will have a different calorie amount to a a boiled potato. A potato if it's hot versus cold will have a different calorie amount if you were to measure it at that pinpoint of time. So it makes me think, okay, there's something clearly wrong here. So we're looking at the grams of food itself. Um, and of course, see, some people would like to follow a guideline. So, okay, I, I don't want to follow a guideline of 200 grams of chicken four times per day and one meal of salmon. I want to eat I don't know, 150 protein and 100 fat or something. Okay, then mm -hmm. there's your macronutrient guidelines. I'll just make sure the food that you're eating matches those guidelines. There's levels to it. Um, so what people will notice whenever I write a diet plan is I'll have, you know, diet plan or something along those lines, nutritional plan, nutritional intake. And it will just say, like I said before, guys, 500 grams of beef mince, 80% lean, 20% fat, six eggs, I don't know, two ounces of cheese or 56 grams if you're British. Um, then maybe, I don't know, 200 milliliters of milk. I might even just say 200 grams of milk. Something you can just chuck on a scale wet. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a pretty accurate measurement because, you know, you're just telling people to eat the grams of food that they are going to eat. Of course, if we go back down the scale to something less accurate, which is the macros, then you're allowing people to understand if the food itself is raw or cooked. So that can drastically change the composition of the food. Um, for example, 200 grams of cooked chicken breast would have more macronutrients than 200 grams of raw chicken breast because you lose about 20% of the weight due to the water loss, um, condensation, vapor, stuff that runs out of it like fat, you know, water, whatever it happens to be. Um, so yes, we can look at macronutrients in that sense as well. And that's more of a general guideline, but yep. the hierarchy for me, um, at least without actually going to a lab, testing every single food group that we have and putting it in our mouths that day. Um, the best way to do it is to look at the food grammages itself. 
then the macronutrient grams. Then you might look at maybe maybe food labels itself to understand the macronutrient grams. But that's always a detraction because it means people can look at the labels rather than look at the, the intake of macro, macros itself. So what I mean by that is um, they're hyper-focused on what's on a label, you know, but we, what's on a label can be 20% off, guys, plus or minus. So if you're buying a specialist beef bar or, I don't know, a protein bar of some sort, you know, whatever you guys in, in the video that are watching this like to, like, like to, like to eat, sorry, um, that could be plus or minus 20%. But you know, if you're eating 200 grams of beef mints, that is 200 grams of beef mints. You just, the only difference is you have to eat the fat that comes off when it's rendered. So that way you know what you're eating is what you're eating. Um, yeah, what else do you think towards that, Jeremy? What do you see in the yeah. um, nutrition space online? Yeah, I, um, I would kind of backtrack a bit and say that one of the reasons you and I are, are bigger fans of either just weighing food or counting macros, and there's a whole spectrum of things that are more or less ideal in terms of ways to approximate food intake. But one of the reasons that we're bigger on this approach compared to counting calories is you could have two diets that are the exact same number of calories, but depending on the macronutrient composition, how much protein, carbs, or fat is being consumed to get to that calorie number, you can have a really significant difference in the total grammage of food consumed. And if everything that you digest is integrated in your cells or metabolized for energy or stored, then it stands to reason that a diet that has more total grammage of macronutrients is probably going to be more conducive to some degree of fat storage. Um, and the mass balance model that we both advocate was created in a sense as an explanation for why low carb or ketogenic diets seemingly are more advantageous than uh, standard Western diets when both are compared on a calorie per calorie basis. Um, I think the way that I would answer your question is probably starting at what's closer to ideal, how I do contest diets for myself. And if I had someone that wanted to get ready for a bodybuilding show, how I would, I, how I would structure a diet for somebody that I think is, is fairly ideal and then from there, we can talk about uh, different client preferences and, and things that are probably a little bit less ideal. But if I'm getting ready for a show um, based on my body size and composition, I'll, I'll set a starting point, um, a certain amount of protein and fat. And then I'll write up a basic diet plan, breakfast, lunch, dinner, you know, either anywhere from two to four meals a day. And it'll be the same foods at the same time every day. And then depending on how my body reacts, um, as I need to lose body fat, I'm just skimming portions from those meals. So if I'm having, uh, you know, 500 grams of beef for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and it's 80, 20 beef, and I keep everything exactly the same, you know, my first, uh, food cut as I'm trying to get leaner might be going down to 400 grams of beef in that first meal. Um, but it's really, really small changes in a very consistent approach that leads to some of those long-term results. Um, there's, pros and cons to whether you measure your food before you're cooking or after cooking. And Jonathan nailed it. If you're measuring your food before you cook, then any kind of fat that renders off, if you're cooking beef inside of a pan, you need to eat that fat. Um, and like, I enjoy doing that. I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, but I, I love taking the fat that renders off, you know, a steak or a burger patty and pouring it on top and drinking it out of a bowl. Um, I love doing that, but some people that's maybe not their cup of tea. What, what matters more in that regard is consistency. Um, if you just know that you're kind of hitting cooked macros, um, you can get a relatively decent idea. If you have a quarter pound beef patty, you know that that's approximately 400 so-called calories, a certain amount of protein and a certain amount of fat. Um, and if you're eating a set number of those every single meal, then from there you can make the adjustments, but the consistency is going to be the bigger uh, factor in that. So yeah, in a, in an ideal sense, I think weighing your food before it's cooked, if you're able to collect any kind of runoff from the cooking process and consume that, that's going to give you the most accurate way to measure the amount of food that you're eating. Um, and the more consistent you can be with having precise amounts of food, the easier it's going to be to track your progress and then make adjustments based on what you need for your body. Um, is that, kind of similar to what you do in contest prep, Jonathan, or, or how you would write up a diet for somebody? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much to a T. Um, 
I mean, we're always looking at the food grams at the end of the day. Um, the most important thing, like you said, is the consistency factor. Um, I was approached by a fellow carnivore coach, Colt Milton, from Skullbells TV on YouTube. Um, he asked me the same sort of question last week, and basically what I said was this kind of discussion we had off air, I believe, um, about tallow, ghee, lard, butter. And I made a point in that video where I was saying, okay, butter is about 82 grams of fat per 100 grams of actual butter weight because there is a there is a salt component to it and a water component to it. It's not pure solid fat. It is a very rich source of saturated fat by all means, but it's not solid like tallow, which is 99 grams of fat roughly. So um, he, sort of, he, asked, he sort of asked me the question like, okay, so I should reduce my grams of fat for clients by this. So I've been just pretending to have a tablespoon of tallow. But if they don't like that, they can have a tablespoon of butter. I said, well, no, if they've been having a tablespoon of butter and they've always been having a tablespoon of butter, changing the number for the sake of changing the number isn't going to be useful. You know, there's a level of consistency if they've always had that tablespoon of butter. Um, that's what's the most important thing. You know, just stay consistent with the food amount you're having. So, yeah. like I said, ultimately, it comes down to the food you're eating. Um, it would almost be ideal for me to say to a client, like, say they're on 500 gram beef, 8 to 20, and say six eggs. It'd be great if I could just say to them, reduce your ground beef by, I don't know, say 10 grams um, each week for the next four weeks. So 490, mm -hmm. 480, 470, 460. Then after that point, I might say, okay, we don't really want to decrease your food volume that much. So what we're going to do is we're going to then um, change up to 15% fat ground beef. So 85, 15. Yep. Then I'd look at the numbers myself as a coach, then identify, okay, we need to up or minus this, you know, just to make sure the grammages of macros are about the same. But ultimately, it's going to follow that way down the line. Um, and then, of course, if they need to add fat, we can buy them tallow, ghee, butter, lard, whatever you like. And you can just eat that from the spoon pretty much or just put it on top of the food you're right to eat and hope it doesn't melt down to the bottom of the plate and go gooey if you don't like it that way. I don't personally mind it. Jerome doesn't eat but <laughs> some people are funny no. about that. Yeah. But yeah, there's ways around it, guys, so you can um, effectively find a way to measure food intake without even looking at a label you know if you always get to the same butcher every week you're saying okay uh mr mr butcher we're gonna have a uh, two pounds of ground beef or you know two pounds of steak you might have one of those pounds one day and the other pound the other day the chances are guys that's going to be a pretty similar cut of meat and it's going to be pretty similar to the fat and protein grams it will mm. not be exact of course but to get really exact guys you're gonna to have to sort of find a super lean cut of beef then add separate fat grammages to it itself so you might buy beef fat trimmings with that that's the way you can be super duper accurate but then you have to like beef fat trimmings or add butter to it but then it kind of goes further away from like the pure beef diet that some people like to follow so a lot of people have issues such as histamine intolerance perhaps uh, maybe they can't process uh, rendered fat very well perhaps they do better of um, dairy fat like myself I don't know there's lots of different ways to skin a cat, but um, we can simplify it. And it's it's strange sometimes when I make a plan for someone, I sort of say, oh, okay, when you eat this food, then they're asking you about like the calories. And I say, I've given you the food here. You don't need to worry about the calories. Because the only yeah. reason why they want to know the calories is if they can eat food that has um, that comes from a product which has a label. Because you, you, you need to buy a pack of beef mints, guys. It comes in a pack of beef mints. And yes, it will have like calories protein fat in it um but that's going to be pretty consistent across the board but you know stuff that's in packages can be all sorts of different things you know processing of like the grains the flour i don't know the seed oils um all these things change their their weight effectively and their composition in terms of like you know if they're saturated or not if they're rancid you know all these things come into it so yeah the um calories thing should be by now um stomped off, dismissed, ignored. Hopefully um, that might be about the end of it, but mm -hmm. do you have any sort of added comments to make to that, Jerome? Yeah, I was um, I, I was going to kind of speculate a little bit. I don't know exactly how you structure diets for your clients, um, but I assume, and I just looked at your website while you were talking, so I, I apologize for not giving you my full attention, but uh, to get a diet plan from Jonathan is 30 British pounds. And I assume the way he goes about that is 
after some initial correspondence, figuring out what foods you like, a little bit about your size, your training history, your goals, um, Jonathan will probably, the way I imagine him doing it is come up with kind of a starting point in terms of the amount of protein and the amount of fat that you should have. And then, um, figure out how much of certain amounts of food gives you a sample sort of menu that meets that target for the day, eating foods that are carnivore that you enjoy eating. You know, so not everybody likes 73, 27 ground beef. Some people can only get 80, 20 or 85, 15. Um, so if you want to save yourself a lot of time and a lot of guesswork, you know, some correspondence with Jonathan and buying a diet plan is a, is a great way to save yourself a lot of time and a lot of headaches. And, I think our goal as coaches is to give somebody kind of an ideal starting point and say, this is what we think is the best way to get the job done. And a lot of times the the marker of a great plan is simplicity. So if Jonathan writes up a plan that's, you know, over the course of a day, maybe 750 grams of 80, 20 beef and six large eggs, um, and then, a you know, certain grammage of butter, um, the more consistent you can be with that, like th there's nothing magical that Jonathan and I do when we get down to like three, four, five percent body fat. Usually what we're doing is it's very boring if you look at it. We're just consistently <laughs> adhering to the same thing day in and day out and then making really, really small adjustments. Um, so is that kind of a, a brief enumeration of some of the work that you do behind the scenes when you create a diet plan for somebody? Is that kind of how your, your process works? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds very accurate. Um, what it is, is I usually advise a consultation prior to the diet plan. The reason being, there's always more information that someone can divulge sometimes through um, the verbal form than just the, the written form. We're always limited by the fact that you, you can write things on a screen, 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 so I could give you guys a client intake form. You could think, okay, that's good, I'm going to fill that out, you know. But then, oh, I, I forgot I was taking antidepressants for the last six months. Then you're telling me the symptoms, and I'm, if I don't have that information, I won't have an idea of where you are, where you're looking to go, what you've been through. So all these things come into it. I do look at people's background as best as I can. Um, so I'm not, for example, going to put someone on a, a fasting regime if they tell me the last time I tried fasting, um, I had severe anxiety and panic attacks. That's mm -hmm. why consultation is useful, to get all the back information I can. Um, then, of course, yes, once I have a consultation, it's not a prerequisite, but it is helpful just to get a more accurate um, guide of what I need to do as a as a coach. So then I can find out, okay, is your client take form that you sent to me? So give me different information, your stats, what you're currently doing. Um, the great thing is I do look at people's individual stats and what their current diet is. I'll actually calculate that and I'll do the best estimate that I can of what they're currently doing. Um, I do find in most cases people calculate their food intake wrong. So mm. I'll look at what they're saying to me that I have. They say, I, can't, I have, in the case of, again, like the 500 grams of ground beef, 8 to 20, 6 eggs, 50 grams of butter. Um, then they'll tell me, okay, the macros for that are this, 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 and this. And they'll tell me, oh, it's raw cooked. I'll then actually look those foods up with the best analysis software that I can get. And I'll see, okay, that's quite far off. You've been over or under shooting your, your uh, macronutrient intake by plus or minus to perhaps 10 grams sometimes. And that's quite that's quite common. Um, so that means, if for example I'm going to make a very slight diet change for you through the diet plan, and then you've given me a over representation of how much food you're eating, but then I almost give you an under deliverance of the food then take that you need, that could yield like really bad results. So that's why I find like just having the the food itself is important. How mm. much food do you eat each day? That's what I want to know. How many, how many grams of what food do you eat each day? Um, how often do you eat per day? What are your meal timings? I mean, it's very hard to give a very accurate representation of how much I think someone should be eating because how much someone can eat can vary a lot. Um, and at the same time, how often people want to eat can vary a lot. I, I quite like eating four times a day. I can do three. I could do two, but I don't like doing two. I don't feel good eating two. So all these things come into it. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, I might have, for example, one client with, say, a body type and I might have another client with a body type so matching body fat body composition everything's the same but they're coming from a different starting point so the first person might be doing chronic cardio sessions for an hour each day and this that and the other 
but then they might be have like a plateau or a stall in their, their fat loss. The other person will be doing no activity, but they don't have the same composition still. So that means I'm looking at their activity levels um, as well as many other things to determine this is where they are right now and this is where they need to go. So although they have the same stats as human beings, the same body fat, um, things like that, same muscle mass, my my target for them to, we, to reach as their diet plan is going to be different. So you'll never see two diet plans I create ever the same, ever. Yeah. It's impossible because I <laughs> what I actually do is um, I hand write all these things. It's not... I, I can see the value of using a spreadsheet because it makes things a bit easier graphically or visually to see sometimes. Um, the important information is clear, is deliberate, and is that, 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 that. You know, it's very simple. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I explain each thing. So I can say, based on what you're current, currently telling me, what I know about you, your stats, I think you might need to do this. I'm cautious of this. This is what I'm thinking about when I'm making it. So I, as if I'm talking to a person, I'm rationalizing what I am and I'm not doing. Um, then of course I'll put in the macronutrients below after the food grams because that gives people an idea. If I go off that, I follow that. So they won't be perfect, but it's the next best case scenario. So that's how I work. Um, yeah. Now saying that as well, I will offer the, them the opportunity to sort of change food round. You know, not everyone's robotic. Not everyone can eat the same foods every day. So I might <laughs> say, okay, you can you can swap out, you know, chicken thighs for salmon or something you know, sort of a, a relatively similar sort of change terms like protein and fat grams. Of course, that'll never be perfectly accurate, in which case I'll say, you know, here's your macros. Use the foods that you want to swap, swap out, but try and follow the macros. So that's why food tracking, macro tracking is important. Mm -hmm. um, now, with this being said, there are people out there that can get into shape without all this tracking and counting of things. Um, it's not a prerequisite to get a good body or a good physique. But it can help people along the way with binge eating, um, people that perhaps are unsure, have been misguided online. Perhaps they've read an article it doesn't really give the correct information. You know, in that mm. sort of instance, I can give them the right kind of um, information that they might need. So that's kind of how I work about it in a very straightforward kind of way. Yeah. I laughed uh, partway in your answer because I'm reminded of a, a very famous bodybuilder who hosts a certain podcast or radio show that um, basically had the same diet for everybody. And this is a guy that popularized ketogenic diets and bodybuilders a number of years ago. And there were either two or three tiers to his version of the ketogenic diet. And it was fixed. It was it was an exact amount. This is the exact amount of these foods that you eat every single day. And there's only two or three tiers based on body weight. And if you need to get your body weight lowered, then you move to like the next tier down um, as your weight corresponded. So knowing the amount of time that goes into coaching people and actually creating uh, workout plans and, and diet plans based on all of this information, um, I guess anybody that's planning on talking with Jonathan, I would highly urge you to err on the side of giving him too much information. Um, please do you, you will definitely get your money's worth and you cannot give him too much information because the, the more information he has, the better he can create a plan that is likely to be a much better starting point for you. Um, you're right in that there's a lot of people that don't have to track their food that meticulously. And there, we've seen a lot of success, success stories within the carnivore community of people losing significant amounts of weight and some people that get into, you know, unbelievable shape without really tracking much food at all. But there's also a, a lot of individuals that have either hit like a weight loss plateau or they've seen some progress, but maybe they're not kind of seeing the results that they think that they should be getting. And anytime you kind of stall like that, or anytime you're not getting the results you think you should get, you, you really only have two choices. You either need to raise your standards or you need to lower your expectations. And between the two, I, I would much greatly prefer people raise their standards and so we can get them moving in the direction that they want to go. Um, so that being said, there's we're trying to lay out what we think is, is as close to ideal as possible. But you and I have both worked with enough people to know that some people, at least initially, can't follow a plan. And that's fine. Um, like you said, some people need some variety in their meal. Some people, it's a little bit too strict. And Jonathan and I are both committed to people's long-term success. We're not going to be dogmatic and say, this is what you need to do. And any deviation from this, it's your F up and that's your fault. And you can't put that on me as your coach. I think a good coach can use a variety of methods 
to still get the job done. I mean, that's what clients are paying for. So Jonathan, if you have somebody that you write up a diet plan and they just can't seem to stick to it, how do you kind of go about that? I know there's, I know that's a tough question because it, so much of that is going to be based on the individual, but what's kind of your thought process for the next step to take if that's the case? Of course, yeah. So my first thought is probably looking back to their goals. You know, they've approached me and they've paid me for my time, my expertise, so on and so forth. Um, so what I'm thinking there is they've invested part of themselves, probably they've earned to reach a certain goal. I'd obviously kind of ask them, okay, your goal is this. Is that goal appropriate for you? Like, appropriate goal might be for someone, oh, I want to drop five pounds and keep it off. I want to do that in three months. That's very achievable for most people, I think. Unless they're, of course, very, very lean. But, um, you know, that's a very achieve achievable goal. So I might say, okay, your goal is achievable and you can do it because everyone else can do it or most people can do it quite successfully um so i'd find out i'll ask them what what are your um objections is it the diet itself you can't stick to is it that you're lacking motivation is it the diet is too complex for you to follow is it too simple or maybe you want a variety of it as well mm -hmm. is it that your social circles your space around you people eat lots of um, bad food so to speak so there's a few ways I'd go about finding out what the problem is. But of course, the first thing to know is what is the problem? Yep. Um, my second thought is what am I going to do as a coach who they've invested their hard earned money into going to do to help them reach their goal? So I then ask them, okay, what can I do to help you? And it might be that I can't quite do anything because they need to have their own, their own way, their own sort of path that I need to follow. Perhaps they need to speak to someone that has the expertise that I don't have. Hmm. Um, perhaps there's some kind of some kind of extreme kind of like appetite they have because of all the fasting, all the dieting they've done in the past. Perhaps they've been volume eating for a long period of time. Or perhaps also on the flip side they've been under eating for a long period of time. So me getting them to where they need to be eating in terms of like to reach their goals could be different. Um, so what I always kind of say to people is my aim by the, assuming I'm in a coaching sort of situation or a diet plan and consultation situation, I'll say, okay, but my aim by the next two weeks is to identify what makes you feel better, um, gets you close to your goals, or at least keeps your body composition stable. So, okay, mm -hmm. from that information, I know, you know, I'd, I'd ask them, okay, you've got 95% adherence or 90% or whatever they have to, have, have to tell me. Um, the close to 100% it is, the better. It means I can make changes a lot more um, appropriately and as needed. And of course, the good feedback is also important. So we're looking at recovery, um, stool frequency, perhaps blood tests if people can afford to take them. Um, how, how's your skin quality? Is your hair falling out? Um, are your knees sore? What's your energy levels like? Are you sleeping properly? Um, are you moody? All these things are things that I do ask people, or at least... Um, in some cases, make it mandatory that they feed this information back to me because it means I have an idea of where they've been through before, where they're trying to go, and what things they're um, conscious of it, what things they're conscious of. So I can understand, okay, this is what I need to do as a coach to improve their experience with me as someone that's um, been coached into my experience, my um, kind of path kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah I think understanding their why is important then also understanding how you're going to help them is also important. Mm -hmm. so it's always going to be um, a multifaceted approach. And for most people, it just means one thing has to change. So like I said, once their weight's stable, I've got a, a, a relative like balance of what I understand. Then to eating each day, their adherence levels, I can then decide, do I need to make an adjustment or not? Mm -hmm. um, the important thing as well is honesty. If someone's saying, they're looking at the food intake I've given them and it's too much food. Like a, a lot of food for what they think subjectively. Um, they, they, what they think is a lot of food. I might then think, well, they might think, um, oh, I need to start, start burning this off a bit. I'm going to sneak in some more cardio sessions. That makes my job harder <laughs> because I'm then fighting against another piece of information which I didn't know about. Yeah. Um, and it's not necessarily a problem because people don't stick to the plan 100%. But yeah. it's very helpful when people can outline what's going on. You know, yeah. if, if perhaps they have to take an extra day off the gym because they're 
tired because he got family family business. Just just tell me. I was with family yeah. on Saturday because I had a party. All right, fine. What do you eat? Well, I had some cake and a bowl of peanuts and had a glass of wine or something. You know. All right, that's fine. Well, you've done that now. There's nothing we can do to undo that. Um, perhaps you enjoyed that, and perhaps you having the experience was better for you in terms of like long term diet adherence. So perhaps that's worth it. You know, I'm I'm not one to judge people based on that. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's effectively how I'd go about someone's diet plan. You know. And how I'd make adjustments based on their adherence levels and how compatible they find it with um, their own kind of idea of what is good and what isn't. Yeah, excellent. Uh, and you've probably seen that too, where a lot of people will be really hesitant to tell you if they've fallen off plan. Um, and as a coach, it's like it's it's my job to get you where you want to go, and I'm I'm your biggest fan. And I'm not going to come down on you. I'm not going to kick your ass endlessly about this. We're going to make the necessary adjustment, and we're going to keep moving forward. Um, we want to see our clients succeed because that, that's a win-win for everybody. So some people just don't like to track anything, um, but they, they might still want to move in a direction. So assuming somebody's not paying you for a diet plan or maybe they're paying for a consultation and just want some general guidelines of, uh, you know, let's say they have another 20 kilos to lose on uh the carnivore diet they're eating the right foods but maybe they're just you know eating too much of some things and and not enough of another um what kind of general guidelines would you give somebody who is seemingly stuck and wants to lose a little bit more weights in their carnivore journey the carnivore journey i mean i'd suggest they stick to the foods that they enjoy and not listen to fads and things like that um oftentimes people are caught up in you know, guys, like the stick of butter a day kind of thing. Like, how do you know that you needed a stick of butter? How do you know it wasn't 100 grams of butter you need or 135 grams of butter you needed? You know, there's nothing magical about individual foods or individual kind of amounts of foods. You know, as I always say, like our bodies are a biologically dynamic system. We're not going to get all the results that we're looking for by keeping the same thing all the time. Like my appetite will go up and down for different foods and that's very normal. So when people ask me how much food you eat, I say, at the moment I'm eating da 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 da. And that'll be true within um a pretty close confidence in interval, maybe ninety, ninety five percent, which is pretty pretty accurate. It's a it's a good um guideline for what I'm doing for myself. Mm-hmm. Now, if you ask me a month later, it'd be a different situation. It could be more or it could be less. It could be different foods itself. Um so yeah, getting back to your point, I think if what they're doing is anything better than what they're doing before is yeah. important. So they might be, for example, you know, maybe they're sort of making loads of brown butter bites and they're making them all the time, but they're making like heaps of them. If they could just like limit themselves to like two or three a day, for example, if they could limit themselves to a bit less than they had before, they're still mm-hmm. having the food, they still enjoy it. Um, they might also find a way to make it um, less dense in terms of fat grams. They might actually use butter instead, which would decrease the fat a little bit. Um, that might be a nice alternative as well. So they might be doing tallow bites, then butter bites. That's like a, a very simplified example. But, you know, you'll yeah. get people as well that are perhaps volume eaters. They're like, I must eat uh, six burger patties per day. Okay. Well, what you can do with those six is put them into a big mold, like squeeze them all together then take maybe 10% of that meat off and divide it by six again. You're still having six burger patties a day. You're just eating yeah. less food. Yeah. So, you know, people don't, people don't know um, sometimes what to do. And I think that's quite, quite a troublesome thing. That's why coaching is very valuable. Yeah. Um, Trying to think of more examples really, but what, yeah. what, what do you suggest, Jerome? Well, I, I guess I want to start by saying, I apologize for the, the kind of vague questions. Um, in, in a certain way, writing up really precise diet plans is, is it's a lot of work, but it's, it's relatively easy in a sense. Um, but I, I'm trying to ask questions so that we can kind of cover the entire spectrum of anybody that's looking to improve their body composition 
anywhere along the, the spectrum of people that will follow the most rigid of plans, you know, 100%, you know, what's ideal. But then I also want to try and cover people who don't want to track anything. They don't want to eat carnivore. They, they want to be able to eat the foods they want to eat. And how can we give some advice to those people as well? Um, because too many coaches will just say, this is the plan and you need to stick to it. And if you can't, then that's your problem. And I just despise that mindset. So a lot of times when I work with people and most of what I, almost everything I do here in my studio is, is workout oriented. And I'm happy to discuss diet and nutrition with people. But um, usually the first thing I start with, with the people that I have is just make better decisions. Um, and I'm just trying to create really basic habits um because the people that i work with they're coming here for the workouts but a lot of times they just don't pay any attention to what they eat um and i need to kind of put things in an appropriate frame of reference that what you do here in my gym will will matter it will make a difference but diet's going to be significantly more important so as a starting point i usually just tell people whatever you know what have you tried in the past that has because odds are if somebody's trying to lose weight, they've, they've done something before and odds are they've, they've tried a couple of things that have had varying degrees of results. You know, what have you tried in the past that has worked to a certain extent and what have you been able to stick to for a while? Um, and I can either nudge them in that direction, depending on the success that they've had. Otherwise, uh, a lot of people I say, just start making better decisions. If you're going to have, if you have dessert every night after dinner, just have half of a dessert tonight. And it probably won't make a difference on the scale over the first week or two, but that's not what's important. What's important is you're making a conscious decision to raise your standards, to point yourself in a direction that you ultimately want to go. And then once they're not thinking about that and that's just become a conditioned habit, then we'll start looking at more specifics. Maybe we'll cut back on more of the foods that they know they shouldn't eat and start trying to get in more of the things that they should be eating. Normally I have to raise people's protein and cut back on highly processed foods quite a bit. Um, so that's usually the direction that I start pushing people in, but I, that's very, very different than people that are buying consultations from me for the purpose of getting diet aligned. Um, and you were 100% right earlier when you said that there are so many questions that have to get addressed through a consultation to really understand where somebody is coming from, what their goals are, what timeline they kind of had in mind, where they're at, you know, are they training, their their food preferences, their do's and, and, and don'ts. There's some things that some people just will not do with their diet. And I want to be respectful of that. Um, one of my biggest client transformation successes. I've put his video on my YouTube channel before he lost 50 pounds in six months and, and he wanted to count calories. So I don't like that approach, but that was the approach that we used. Um, and it worked very well for how his brain was wired and his preferences. Um, so yeah, the old adage, there's a million ways to skin a cat. I, I look at it like there's a roadmap. And if you want to go from one city to the next, the fastest way to get there is going to be taking the freeway and that's going to be weighing your food and eating as close to the same foods every single day. Um, that's going to be as close to taking the freeway as possible. Counting calories is like trying to take the back roads the entire way and zigzagging all over the place and making tons of stops. It'll still get you there. It's just a less efficient way of going down that road. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it really depends where somebody is at and to steal that line that you use a lot. It's, it's how long it's a piece of string. Yeah, that's that's great advice. The things I think I can add to that really. Okay. So I know right. we've I know we've rambled quite a bit. Yeah. Um, we were certainly willing to take any questions today. They could be about tracking food intake. Um, it could be about training. But um, I, I think the way that we're going to be taking these ramblings, like you said last time, is we're going to have a topic that we mull over for a bit of time, and then time pending, we'll certainly take any questions that come up. Um, but I think this is really important. Because there's a there's a big gap of people when Jonathan and I put out content and we say that, you know, calories are a poor measure of food intake, where a lot of people say, okay, I get that, but what do I do now? And and hopefully our ramblings today kind of give people some options of how to go about that if they're not going to track calories. Yeah, the, the, the point of my channel is, um, I'm sure Jerome Armstrong's channel as well, if you guys aren't subscribed to that, please do. The point is to provide helpful information. Um, to learn from each other and actually provide solutions so you won't catch me 
putting others down without providing a solution to the problem they're causing. You know, like I've made some different videos recently. Um, I've got another one out which is about a vegan bodybuilder talking about stuff. Um, you will see me put him down in the video, and I will put him down quite a bit. But I've been very fair with my critiques, um, I'm very honest, and it is with the best intentions in mind. So, mm -hmm. you know, just just bear that in mind when you're watching my videos. It's um, it's not of malice or forethought. It's for everyone's benefit, and hopefully, as time goes on, everyone's entertainment. Yeah. So, and I, I love your expression of aligning physicals with positive health outcomes because um, the long-term success rate of people that want to make a significant change in their body composition is like less than 5%. Something like 95 to 99% of people that ever lose a significant amount of weight will gain all the weight back plus an additional like kilo. Um, so in a lot of ways, the, the approach that most people take does more long-term harm than good. And both you and I are committed to the, the long-term success of our clients. We want people to get the results that they want, but have it contribute in a positive way towards their life to where they don't just have to build up willpower for three to six months, suffer through a diet, and then once it's over for whatever reason, they can go back to the old habits that made them in poor health in the first place. Um, you know, we're really committed towards changing the direction of that 95% that fails. It, it should be 95%, you know, hit their results and hit their goals and are able to maintain it. Um, so I think you and I are both very much committed towards that kind of long-term success. Yeah. Yeah, I know what it's like to feel most scammed by supplement companies and people selling eBooks and plans. And I know you've, you've had the same sort of experience. Yeah. yeah. And it's not <laughs> conducive to, um, it's certainly not conducive to, um, a good business model yeah. yeah as much as we're here talking about um how great of a coach i apparently am and how great of a coach <laughs> jerome is you know there is the fact the underlying fact that we're doing it for people's benefit you know so what i've done along with sophie and jerome's also been a great helping hand along the way is we've created a facebook group called the carnival crew so i'm sure lots of people that watch this video either be in it or have heard of it before that's basically a soft coaching approach to getting advice you need without actually having a consultation or really spending a lot of money. So that's kind of like the cheaper approach. Um, other options I have, the diet and training plans, completely specific to the person that's buying them, you know, very individualized. Then, of course, you've got the consultations. That's almost like a step up. So that's okay. Um, I want to speak to you about lots of issues I have and I need to get from A to B. Give me some ideas of how I'm going to do that. And here's the questions I have. Here's my backstory. Yeah. And I can quite succinctly answer your questions and um, provide a good outline of what you need to be doing, or at least what I think is most useful. Um, the next option, of course, is the coaching, which is a more expensive service, although still half the price of the next nearest person in terms of experience in um, academia. I think the next nearest person in price actually has less experience than academia. You know, the next nearest person in terms of price to, to me and the carnival community. So that's what we're getting at here. But um, yes, of course, then obviously the next thing as well is to add on consultations onto that. So I have a, a multi-tiered approach to access my information. We've got the YouTube videos. We've got the group. We've got the diet training plans, consultations, coaching, then the coaching plus consultations. Then all yeah. of the above if you um, want to proceed. So between that, if I can't help you, the problem is probably out of my area of expertise which is so far not happened, at least in the cases I've had with different clients. Um, it might be that you have a severe binge eating disorder. Not my, my area of, in, in, um, eating, my area of expertise, although I have had that before. Hmm. I'm not someone with enough experience with clients on an individual level to really give a good outline of what is and isn't good for that person. I can give sort of mild suggestions, but you, you, know, you need to speak to someone like Pim Johnson you know, that's going to be a better sort of um, person to speak to, like a coach. Um, then if it's a question related to your your blood tests, you know, things that are going on internally, your physiology, um, Bart K, so Professor Bart K. Um, then if, you know, that doesn't go very well, you've got even more people you can speak to. You know, there's there's people in my um, my circles and drone circles that we speak to that we can provide some, some kind of like, although I'm not paid, um, it's like an affiliation basically. So you trust their expertise. So I'll then put my clients onto them if they need that help. Um, then of course there's going to be someone else out there one day, which is 
supersedes all of us in terms of knowledge. And uh, when a person comes out, I'll be out of pocket. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I laugh because off screen earlier today, uh, Jonathan and I were discussing somebody who does online coaching, who charges many hundreds of dollars a month for their clients. And this gentleman's response to somebody having weight loss issues was, well, you're just not accurately tracking your calories. <laughs> and it just, Jonathan knows how frustrated I I get at that response when I see that. And when I see the amount that some people charge for some of that, it just, it drives me bonkers. It drives me absolutely batty. <laughs> yeah. You got, I mean, I think you can coach people well, but I don't think you can coach a lot of people well. You know, like, unless, of course, you've got a high profile, maybe you're a doctor, maybe you just work from home and you don't do anything else and you just have people approach you. Yeah, you could probably do that all day and charge people what you want. You know, it's, it's fair game. Um, but I think I personally couldn't see myself coaching more than 20 people at once yeah. with the current level of individuality, specificism that I currently give them. It's not feasible. And 20 is at a push. 20 will be based on my capacity as an individual. Um, so 20 will be with me probably scrapping YouTube. You know? So people out there with like 35, 40, 50 clients um, that have YouTube channels, I'd be highly skeptical of the quality of information they're putting out. At least if they're putting out frequent content, you know? I, I don't think it's likely that they're um, a good coach. Of course, yeah. like... There's levels for everything, guys. You know, if you, like I said, I provide something that people can afford. So if you want, like, a consultation, that's £30. If you want a plan, you know, a diet and training plan is included in the coaching plan itself. So effectively, when you buy my coaching plan, you're spending £20 per month for the coaching element of it. That's insane value for money. Yeah. Like, that is really good value. So people do benefit from that. And... I don't have clients um, angry at me or disappointed, you know, because I, I deliver them the best results I can give them. So, um, yeah, th you've got to set your price right, make sure it's accessible, provide something for everyone, but there will be a, one, a day one day when I will have to increase my prices again. Um, until that time comes, I'm happy charging what I am now. and I'm glad yeah. to have the, the clients I do have. Um, I'm very, very fortunate, so... Well, even, even around here with personal training, I charge more than the big box gym because the one-on-one -on -one attention and quality of attention is, is better. But when you look at most private personal training studios around here, when I started this business, I, uh, I went to every single personal trainer within a certain mile radius to see how much they charge. And like my rates are probably about half as much as a lot of trainers around here. Um, and same kind of thing. I'm trying to make things as accessible for as many people as possible because there's a lot of people that need quality information but can't always afford it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's one thing that drew me to you, Jonathan, is, is your commitment to continually provide the highest quality service at the best possible prices for as many people as possible. I do my best. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. We've got a question. From me that's from the uh jonathan and i keep a reservoir of questions so barring any other questions from the chat we can dip into a few of those we'll go to that one in a sec we've got something from i think it was um someone earlier i saw it not a question sorry one week <laughs> high fat no dairy report but went from 20 hours eating 20 hours not eating to four hours eating too much am I naturally eating half a kilo of meat and fat till full. Slight weight loss, best sleep, enjoying the pork crackling and lard so much. Yeah. Don't surprise me at all. Excellent. Yeah, it'd be interesting to hear your macros if you know them, Tom. Um, I do notice actually saying that, like when people do the lower protein, high fat approach, they do tend to lose weight. At least immediately tend to lose weight. Um, but that's coupled with the lower protein itself. It's not like you can just go full hog and go nuts with the protein, you know, it's the lower protein, I think the, um, the low insulin state probably comes into it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I, I'm a little surprised that taking it from a four hour, two meals to one meal has led to better sleep. Um, but that's awesome. 
I'm, I'm jealous of, of quality sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I would love to do OMAD. Like, like at least the days I can follow it, not like when I'm maybe training. I think, I think to me, two meals is a must for training, at least in terms of the mat food I need to eat. But it would be yeah. so good one day if, like, so I'm like a six-year-old man and I'm just doing, like, two weight sessions per week, for example. Yeah, yeah. OMAD would make life so easy. Be so much more productive. <laughs> all right i've got a question so how should you schedule high intensity training and manage fatigue with bjj what do you think drew what do you do first uh, the first thing i would do is brazilian jiu-jitsu those guys train their asses off and people that there's a mixed martial arts gym right down the road uh, they have multiple training sessions a week um, I think they do BJJ four nights a week for about two hours at a clip. Um, I would try and put your hit session probably no more than one a week as far away from most of that training as possible. Um, any type of sport training just due to the number of repetitions that have to be performed to maintain good athletic form and performance, um, it can be really, really challenging to try and schedule proper resistance training during a competitive season or anything a little bit more hobbyistic. So I think of Steve Maxwell, who has a, has the first Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gym that opened on the East coast, I think in the seventies, um, he's trained Ronda Rousey. He's trained Royce Gracie and he didn't have, or he doesn't have his people do hit training more than twice a week. And most people that he has, and these are high level <laughs> mixed martial artists are training only once a week because the, amount of demand that that is on their body between high intensity training plus all the mixed martial arts training they do is is almost too much that they can recover from um some people depending on how competitive you are collegiate or, or possibly professional athletes might not be able to tolerate any strength training at all during the competitive season um, but ideally probably once a week maybe twice if you can tolerate it maybe three times if you're a freak um, but as far away from your sports specific training as possible. Yeah, that's the way I'd, I'd probably formulate it as well. And just for the point of um, reference to someone that I know that follows something similar. So they train very, very hard. Um, typically in a bodybuilding split, they're doing four sessions per week. They're also doing BJJ like twice a week, I believe. So enough to learn the skill set, but not so much that they're tired, fatigued, and they're um, wearing themselves down. But what they've had to do basically is reduce their training to the gym stuff like three, three times a week. Um, so yeah, the, the the first thing to do would be to split it up as best you can. Yeah. That's probably the most key um, thing I'd put across. And of course, then managing recovery as well is tough, especially if you're doing different sports. Um, you might even try to say, for example, you've got a push day, so chest, shoulders, triceps. But say you know you're doing a lot of grapples with your arms, you might actually put that session further away from your push, set, push session. So it might be that you're doing less pushing movements and grappling and squeezing kind of movements. Then if you know you're doing more maybe footwork, maybe you're doing something more fitness related, more intricate maybe, I don't know, then you might actually mm -hmm. put that um, closer to that sort of session. So I'll probably aim for the... You know, I'd listen to your body in terms of your soreness in different muscle groups and how strong you feel. I mean, my strength after doing push day is not back up to speed for at least four to five days after. Yeah. And even then, it's still not quite 100%. So you might try and tell, end your, your pushing muscle groups to that tail end of the week. Um, that's probably how I'd manage it. And yeah. Hopefully and this if, uh, answers the um, person's question. And if fatigue is really high to the point where it's affecting performance, something is going to have to go. <laughs> like your body has a limited capacity to recover from physical stress. So um, yeah, definitely start by trying to split up your workouts, but at, at some point, um, you know, you may have to keep producing or you might even just the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu training in and of itself could potentially be too yeah, much. You can't do everything, can you? Yeah. But that's, that's a value judgment that somebody has to make based on their performance and you know, what is it just kind of a hobby they're doing? Are they hoping to actually fight? There, there's a lot that goes into that. And somebody needs to kind of make the evaluation on how it's affecting the quality of their life. Whoop. 
looks like Jonathan dropped off for a second. That's okay. Let's go back up and let's uh, Andre. I saw you had a question. We'll get to it in a second. I just want to get to some of these other comments. Brick is a big Nev. I know you guys were here first. Thanks for coming in. Uh, do, 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 do. Lambs, good to see you. I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. Good evening, all. Let the muscle ramblings begin. This is the one I wanted to get to. <laughs> this big nip says, nice glasses. Awesome. Uh, I'm definitely not a professor. These are blue light glasses. I normally wear contacts, but with the amount of time that I spend in front of a screen, um, these are blue light glasses. And then I put the tape on to hopefully look a little bit smarter. Um, but this isn't actually serving a function. So I'm just hoping it makes me a little bit more attractive. Try right, desperately hard, Drew. I, yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to wake up and look completely disheveled and uh, sleep deprived <laughs> and uh, dependent on stimulants. <laughs> so, but now that Jonathan's back, we have to get back to serious time. <laughs> oh yeah, Let's see what's going on. Yeah, apologies, I left you guys. My um, Wi-Fi decided to go. Mm -hmm. Probably got time for one more question. Um. So do you have any advice to people eating mostly chicken on a carnivore mm. diet? Very good question. So the problem I see with people eating a lot of chicken on the carnivore diet is that I don't see a lot of people eating chicken on the carnivore diet. This is a very good point and something that people would look at initially. You know, most people out there, like they get from a standard Western diet perhaps to a carnivore diet are probably or typically eating chicken a bit more than eating beef. Uh, we know the sale of chicken's gone up and the beef was, beef sales might not have gone up quite as much. Um, it's a lot easier to put sauce and fry chicken versus beef. You know, there's more things we can do with it effectively, especially on the Western diet. Um, I think the problem with chicken itself is that the fatty acid profile is not optimal. When I say not optimal, it doesn't mean that you can't live off just chicken. But it'll be a lot more difficult job to do it. Um, you're not going to get much, for example, omega three. The omega six value will be a bit higher. Um, not again, not detrimental, but perhaps not so much of a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, then of course, with chicken, you have to be eating the skin and the thighs to get enough fat in. Um, you might find you're going to have to supplement with fat in some senses. So you're adding tallow, you're adding butter to your your um, food itself. Um, you effectively caking your chicken with butter once you cook it just to get enough fat in so that's how challenging it can be for most people um, and saying that the quality of chicken in terms of the meat itself can be quite different um, over the globe i mean the welfare standards typically aren't very good um, if you're concerned personally or ethically about eating chicken versus beef of course chicken's going to be you're you're taking more lives for one meal, basically. Mm. Whereas beef, you know, you eat a cow, that's going to give you three hundred meals. A chicken's going to give you maybe two meals or one meal if you like me and Drew. So <laughs> you know, it's, it's not the best case scenario. And I mean, saying that, I'm not someone that's um, doesn't value or understand the circle of life. I appreciate we have foods to eat. Um, we have a way of living that we must uphold as human beings. Um, at the same time. I do have a soft spot sometimes for like these little animals, you know, so saying that yeah. a lot of people in the carnival community aren't eating chicken very often. Um, I've maybe like a few hundred people that I consulted with, I'd probably say, I'd say at best, maybe 10% of them have chicken every week. And that means they're just having it like once, maybe twice a week, like some chicken fries or something. It's not commonly eaten. Um, and also as well, I don't think that it's a bad thing. I do think that we have a, we don't want to be too restrictive. I mean, if it's going to stop someone from following the diet itself by just eating um, beef, then of course add in some other food. That's going to be 10 times better than eating a mixed diet of plants and spinach and crap in it, you know? So mm -hmm. um, trying to think of other points to mention really. Um, I mean, oftentimes chicken to people doesn't taste that nice. It's not something you can eat on its own, really. I mean, salt and beef works well. Salt and chicken, not so good. Not so interesting. So um, the palatability aspect comes into it as well. 
Um, and of course, if you're a bodybuilder like myself or Jerome, we're bored of eating chicken breasts now. We've been doing this for like probably a decade. Yeah. <laughs> we're sick to death of it. So that's another reason why Jerome and I probably aren't the biggest advocates of eating chicken. But do you have any yeah. thoughts on that, Jerome, at all? Yeah, if I never eat a uh, boneless, skinless chicken breast again in my life, I would I would die a happy man. Um, I've done that for so many contest preps. Uh, I enjoy, but I seldom buy bone-in skin on chicken thighs. Um I don't, it's, yeah, I'm a pretty lazy cook when it comes to carnivore, but I used to cook for my family almost every night. So yeah, you can get, chicken's a little bit more of a blank palate. You can, you can get a little, you know, interesting with seasoning. So, um, chicken thighs, you know, seasoned and pan fried in, like, I love cooking with ghee because that has a much higher smoke point than butter or even a lot of tallow. Um, deglaze with a little chicken stock, maybe a little white cooking wine, uh, maybe a little bit of lemon juice and add some butter to that. And you can kind of make a reduction and put it over your pan fried, uh, chicken thigh. It can be really delicious. Um, but, um, yeah, I just, and I haven't had chicken wings in a while, but I know some people in the carnivore community like air frying chicken wings. But even then, um, getting enough fat can be somewhat problematic sometimes, depending on your cut of chicken. Um, I'll have it occasionally. I'm just not. I'm just not a big fan. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a good entry point for some people. Yeah. Um, I know Tilly and Maddie. So Tilly's nearly six. Maddie is now one year old. Um, they'll have chicken mixed on with other things. You know, they might have a chicken omelette with a bit of cheese mm. in it. Um, giving them a ribeye steak might be too tricky for them to eat. You know, when their teeth are a bit wobbly, when they're growing teeth, when they've not got a strong bite, you know, eat, biting for a thick uh, cut of steaks can be hard for them to do. So chicken's a bit easier for some people, I think. Yeah. I say that you can oh. slow cook these things, and we do. You know, we do that sort of thing. But um, it's more of a mixed diet for young ones, but more of a quite straightforward i eat probably about four or five foods most most days so Hmm. the next uh cooking video i'll do i'll make chicken piccata which is just a it's uh chicken stock lemon and butter kind of uh reduction after you're done pan frying your chicken that's a decent way to get a little bit of sauce with some flavor and also get some fat in Uh, you can get a little bit liberal with the butter and it'll just thicken your sauce up uh, quite a bit. And then if you like salts, the, the capers are traditionally added to piccata. Um, but don't tell Jonathan I'm eating capers on occasion because he'll take my carnivore card. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> right. I, I, don't, I don't think things like that are the worst things to eat. To us. It's one of, probably one of the safe things. I've been known to have cucumbers sometimes, some sometimes not often, maybe a bit carrot. Um, <laughs> I could probably count the amount of times to do it, like maybe on one hand over the last year so it's not a big deal for me but i do quite like pickles sometimes like a couple of slices yep. of pickles yep um, just gives you a different taste it's not it's not going to break the bank guys um just when you're sat there with a jar of pickles watching a film that's when you got a problem i think <laughs> it's not really food it's more like a nothing just a different flavor really but that's uh yeah that's one of those contest preparation secrets that jonathan and i don't often divulge to you guys is the amount of times sometimes you'll just be eating sugar-free jello or pickles or sauerkraut or um sugar-free popsicles just something uh sometimes just to eat um but that's usually like the you know two or three weeks before a show when you're going crazy yeah you are not advocating (laughs) those things guys no don't do that simply saying it's better for you to eat foods that are somewhat innocuous compared to going out to like costco or walmart and buying like i don't know a kilo bar of chocolate that's going to be infinitely times worse um, yeah you know when you've got a short you've got a short-term goal it's like oh you have to be in shape in two weeks you'll just to get to that end point you'll do almost anything for so you know, it's, it's not a case of ever, me saying or Joe saying oh everyone should eat this food you know um i've got a recipe coming out soon haven't i a video you do yes it's a gorgeous delicious carnivore cake <laughs> jonathan made a uh, amsr cooking video that he cued in a couple of the people in the carnivore crew uh to this recipe um and it looks it looks fantastic uh so be on the lookout for that it'll be good one 
yeah, I think that's pretty much everything for today, guys. Um, not many questions, but that's fine. We had a good ramble. Um, I might just skim through the chat just to make uh, acknowledgement of everyone that's attended. So we've got, obviously, Rick, Spigniv. Thank you both. Much appreciated. Kyle's also, also in attendance. So it's um, it nice to speak to Kyle again. Um, I believe it was yesterday. Um, so it's nice yep. to have a little chat and catch up with him. Um, very much appreciated. Of course, we've got Lambs. Good evening, Lambs. Hopefully you're still awake and for... Um, full cognitive function I make jokes because he's a bit older ah what are you saying <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got Rick we've got uh, Rich or Rick as well so that's inner circle um, baddest cat I don't know baddest cat's name um, mm -hmm. I know baddest cat is the the channel profile but I don't know the person um, at least I don't know their name we've got a deck of course good to see you thank you for attending um, hopefully we've given you some useful advice to share with the Steak and Butter Gang on exactly how to manipulate um, dietary intakes and what to do in the best possible way, which no one else will tell you for some reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't think a lot of people think well. about. I don't think a lot of people think about some of these things on the the level of depth that we do. I really should save some of the messages that we send each other just analyzing just the most <laughs> obscure things to the nth degree that conversation we had about like measuring fat that comes off mate or oh, if i if if i had 80 20 gram beef and i cooked it then cooked it this time for this long and then i yeah. weighed it off was it weighed this but then the fat weighed this so that means this much because it must have been water Fuck me. and then i <laughs> and then taking my taking my nonstick pan and trying to get every last drop of fat off and just shaking it to get the last little drips and then having that on my food scale so I can measure how much of that rendered fat was coming off. Yeah. Makes you wonder if you wait, <laughs> wait for that like pan to like cool down, get like a thin layer of like tallow over it. You also want to like, get like some sort of like spatula and just go around yeah. all of it and just, and just get every scrape last bit, it off and then, then wait. Yeah. yeah. It's a good idea. A bit like that cake video I made where I was trying to get every last drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have a uh, carnivore dad board in the chat. Um, Sophie's here. I pinned her message. Thank you for attending, Sophie. So, hope you had a good training session. Yeah, I'm glad I actually went to the gym this morning. I had a leg session, and um, Sophie, it gave, it kind of gives Sophie a chance to train a bit more this week. Because also, I'm going to be best up because I did legs. So. Of course, Tom, thank you for attending as well. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you for your continued membership to my channel. I do appreciate that. And, um, it is something I'm looking to push a bit more in the future. So um, I may at some point make these chats membership only, at least the, the live Q&A ones, just because the amount of value that Jeremy and I put in these is um, world class. You know, it's, it's solid stuff. Um, I think we should monetize it. Mm hmm. When I say monitors, the, I mean I mean I mean like charge you like two dollars per month for um right it's, hours and hours yeah. of our time. That's exactly what I was gonna say. Two dollars a month is uh, you know, it's half a cup of coffee at Starbucks, you know. Yeah. And I, I know people in corporate America that go to Starbucks every day on their way to work and spend five or six dollars on a cup of coffee. So Yeah. People do. I, honestly, when I was at uni guys, um there were so I went to the university that was the most diverse in the country and also the most poverty stricken. Hmm. So people that went to my university were very, very poor fee people, you know, very poor. Um, they come from like a low economic background household thing, low social economic backgrounds, they call it, I think. Um, yeah, nearly all of the people in there would like queue up to go to Starbucks, wherever the coffee shop was and spend three quid and a cup of coffee. I'm like, how are you affording to do that? That's like, at the time, that was like two meals for me. I, was, <laughs> I don't know if people just drank coffee just to like appear good and popular and cool, but yeah, yeah. honestly, guys, two dollars, the value is um, insane. It's something for everyone. That's uh, and thank you as uh, well, Jenny, for attending. Mm -hmm. um, just gonna put her comment up here. So yeah, thank you for your kind acknowledgement. It's nice to work on a quite a nice personal level with people, you know. Bear in mind, um, Jenny's approximately the same distance from me as Jerome is in a completely different continent. 
yet you're able to still communicate with people and give them advice and help them out. And mm -hmm. um, in return, you're able to sort of hear their experiences and it's nice to see people progress and learn things along the way. So it's great stuff. And of course, as well, hit the like button, please. Um, I think that's pretty much it for everyone. Excellent. Just want to put this in. Um, great interview with Dr. Sean Baker. Yeah, it was good. Um, Shame about the sound quality, though. It seems to be kind of a reoccurring pattern that we've had recently. <laughs> mm. Mm. A lot of work know. behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah, I went to... Um... Oh, where was it? I went on one of my friend's channels, actually. Um, well, I'm going to be on his channel again soon, so... We did like two or three little rambles. Uh, I sent him the audio file, so hopefully he'll match it to his file and it'll be good quality, hopefully. So it's just when you hear your own audio that you've recorded on your end of the the, um, the computer line software, internet, whatever, it's like, like immaculate. It's immaculate, honestly. Like it's as if you're in the same room as the person. Mm -hmm. like, you can hear me breathing. You can hear like the base of my voice of each kind of word that comes out. But then you go and hear it on someone else's channel, and you're like, "Oh my god, what have you done?" <laughs> <laughs> but then it's 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 crazy because I can get Jerome's voice on my computer from his end without going through the internet. Um, well, basically, anyway, pretty well, pretty quality stuff. So, you know, I'm rambling. Um, so yes, yeah, so if you haven't, guys, please watch that into Dr. Sean Baker. Also, please watch my interview with Jerome which came out I think two days ago I think it was Saturday something like that that was excellent thank you excellent I was, I was certainly inspired hmm. thank you all right we're gonna leave it there now guys um so we'll be back next week Jerome and I um we'll also well I'll also be here tomorrow night at 8 30 UK time so stay tuned for that one uh, I'll be there joined with Mark Ennis and Colt Milton. So that'll be called the Carnivore Coach Corner. And I think that's round nine or ten. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. Mm -hmm. Um that will be in the same format as this video. So we'll have a little talk first. Then if we get some questions related to the talk that we're gonna have, then we'll be able to answer them at the end of the chat if we get time. Um the caveat is if we get time. So I, I can't make promises there, but we are conscious of answering people's questions and providing value to people because I understand you guys are here to learn something and um, we're here to teach you something if we can. Um, and if we can't do that, then we failed. So, yeah, not good. <laughs> Jeremy and I will be upset for like hours and probably lose sleep over if we do fail. So, Yeah, failure is not an option. No. Excellent. All right. Cheers, guys, for watching. I'll see you guys soon. Awesome.